One, two, one, two. Audio is good. Camera is rolling. Fifth wall, off the wall, podcast episode number one, take one. Hello and thank you for joining me, you beautiful, beautiful people. My name's Doug and I am sitting just now in my flat in the east end of London in Hackney Wick and I am going out on both a podcast audio format and a YouTube format. If you're watching this on the YouTube, there's a strong chance this might look and feel quite familiar for you. I have been doing a vlog for the best part of two years now, and I've been using this format to talk about anything and everything to do with the world of street art. And kind of just due to the popularity of the podcast format, I thought it was about time I maybe mix things up and I'm just testing the water to see how this works. So I'm gonna be trying my best to create an audio file, which will be a podcast, and I'm gonna do this on video as well, so it can be crossed over from iTunes or Acast or whatever format this is gonna go out on, but it'll still have a home in the regular place in YouTube. So what makes this different to everything else that I've done before is that well, maybe this is gonna allow a more candid approach into talking about public art, street art, graffiti, and it's gonna be a little bit longer, a little bit more in depth, and, and, and I guess a little bit less scripted to how my usual vlog has been. If this is your very first time tuning in to anything that I've put out, well, welcome. Uh, my name is Doug, Doug Gillen. I live here in the East End of London, have done for about 10 years. And for the last six years, I've been working in various formats, trying to create and engage an audience into the world of street art. And I use street art as a term that kind of all encompasses everything within graffiti, uh, urban contemporary, or whatever names people throw at this, just that culture of kind of uncommissioned public art. And my job as a non-artist is to try and make this cool little scene that I fell in love with when I first moved to East London uh, 10 years ago, try and make that as appealing to as many different people as I possibly can. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, whoa, 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 street art, that's not necessarily for me. This doesn't, this, I don't want this to be like exclusively for people that know loads about street art. It's not necessarily a street art podcast but it will be uh, using street art as a vehicle to talk about wider things. So really I want to use this as a platform to try and open up bigger dialogues about bigger uh, issues just through the vehicle of street art. I can't tell if that was the longest sentence in the history of sentences, but there's nobody else in this room, so it's just me talking. For today's episode, I've decided the best way to go forward and to give you an idea of what to expect is to just look on kind of what I've already been doing in the past. Um, so if you are already a fan of the channel and you're familiar with this, this might be a little bit of a sort of clip show for you. But clip shows are always good because they give you a little recap, a little bit of nostalgia, and maybe you might see some things that you might have missed. And if you want to go and check out any of those, then they're all available on the YouTube channel, which is uh, Fifth Wall TV. So uh, today I will be playing you a couple of clips to try and give you an idea of what to expect in the coming episodes. I have a few more episodes lined up. I have some unreleased content coming up today. So even if you have listened to every single video, every single episode I've ever put out, there will be something at the end. That, I, that you might find interesting. And uh, for those that haven't really experienced this channel before, hopefully this will maybe entice you into going and checking out the previous episodes on YouTube and maybe just to be excited about what you're gonna be hearing in the future. Like I say, the main thing that I'm trying to do is open up wider discussions about absolutely anything using the vehicle of art. It doesn't necessarily have to even be street art, but this is the easiest way for me to kind of, uh, to, to get people involved.
So the first clip I'm going to play you guys is from a few years ago and it was one of one of my first ever videos and I think for me it's kind of like it's my um it's probably one of my most well known because it was when I first came out ruffling feathers. Um, I live in the East End of London and it's an area that has been really known for its its influx of street art and graffiti and it's been really open to this kind of this wild aesthetic for you know for years and I was cycling by one day and I noticed on the side of this big wall there was a mural for a bank and it stopped me dead in my tracks. I was like, oh my god, what is this? I, you know, I'm used to seeing murals and, and, and big like big dominating pieces of beautiful public art and then suddenly, boom, in comes this thing that was advertising a bank and it just completely threw me off uh, my guard and I like went back, I turned around, went back and I, I made this video uh, kind of calling out the people that were responsible for putting this ad campaign together. So here's a little clip from that. So earlier this week, this video popped up in my newsfeed, which was a large scale mural being painted in the East End of London. And they were painting a massive mural of the 1970s cartoon Top Cat as part of a campaign going on by Halifax Bank. These agencies are so happy to just promote any, any campaign that throws money at them. Forget about the fact that we've got a cat from the 70s who still lives in a bin now trying to promote cheap mortgages like that Like forget about that. That is ridiculous in itself, but that's not my beef My beef is the fact that we've now gotten to a point where street art and graffiti is being used to promote and advertise banks I started off with this one because I think it was just a great sort of introduction into some of the topics that I'm going to be covering because I don't feel that there's many other platforms out there that discuss this side of street art. There's a lot of sort of promotion around it and there's a lot of, oh, this looks amazing. This is the prettiest thing I've ever seen. But there's not that further critical dialogue as much as I'd like to see. So I'm trying to fill that little void here. And it won't just be my opinions. You'll you, you'll get to hear from other people as this goes forward. I mean, I, because I live in London, there is a really, really nice network of people that I can bring on and, and engage with. And there's always someone stopping through town. So there should be, there should be no excuses for me not to have a nice rounded um, sort of network of people giving ideas and opinions and hopefully there will be plenty of things discussed here that kind of like they just either make you see something different think about something different or you know stuff that you agree with and, and equally stuff that you're like nah that's wrong like you are talking nonsense so that's why I thought this advertising clip was a really good one to start with and uh, if you want to go check that video out, then please do. It's on the YouTube channel at Fifth Wall TV. The next one that I've gone with was a more recent one. It was uh, just at the tail end of the summer, a few weeks ago from when I'm recording this just now, uh, I was in Norway for filming for the New Art Festival, um, which is a really big street art festival. It's actually the longest running street art festival in the world. It's been going for 18 years, this street art festival. And every year they bring in, you know, countless different artists, anything from 10 to 20, 26 artists it was this year. They bring them into the town of Stavanger on the coast of Norway and they sort of, they let them rip. So they just go out and they do all these uh, you know, installations, these paste ups, these murals, these interventions, and they just kind of like they're let loose around the town, and the results are always incredible. So, I was out in Stavania a couple of weeks ago covering um, the artist Snick, who were painting the inside of the Stavania airport, and they had a couple of days and they were doing this like really, really stunning mural, which you will see is when you arrive in the airport, it's in the arrivals hall, and it's just there on the right as you come through. So literally the first thing you see when you step off this plane is this really stunning mural of these two beautiful women. Um, it's done in a halftone stencil style. So it's it, it, it's an incredible piece of work, but when they were out painting this, we found ourselves with 
actually a day to spare, which is super rare. And the founder and director of New Art had said to us, hey, look, we've got a bit of time. Turns out there's a guy throwing a party on a private island tomorrow. Do you, do you want to come? And I'm like, okay, cool. So it was myself, Nick, who's one half of the duo, Nick, and Martin Reed, the director of the New Art Festival. So we all found ourselves on this private island, which was really cool because they put on an amazing spread and it was an amazing, amazing venue. But we're like, look, man, this is a networking event. And I, I, we found a boat, a little rowing boat. And we're like, look, let's, let's go see what we can do on this boat. So we took a couple of beers and we just rowed. And we just rowed for like, I think we were out there for about four hours, just rowing around in this fjord in Norway. And I decided that it would be the perfect time, the perfect excuse to bring out my camera and just interview the head of the longest running street art festival in the world and an incredibly talented artist. And this is just a little clip from some of the stuff that we talked about. <laughs> it's almost like Doug, isn't it? Yeah. It was me and you on a romantic getaway. Yeah. You didn't bring me to Norway for the art, did you? We don't use the word art around what you, here. What do you call it? We call it street art. Is that what it is? And why? Because it's street, on the streets? Because well, it's on the streets. Well, you because know, you like a buzzword? Well, no, it's kind of a traditional working class... Uh, what, to make it feel more grimy? Mythology of the street, yeah. Why? I think the term urban. Like, stop rowing for a minute because you're putting us in a circle. Let me, let me hit us out in the middle. <coughs> You don't like the word urban, you prefer street. Yeah, I think... Um, right, we need, we need to row now. The neoliberal cultural elite are doing, to row. are doing all they can to strip the street from street art, you know? Mm -hmm. Nasty, transgressive, dirt under your fingernails, prostitutes, drugs. But Norway's got a long history of street art and graffiti. Did it have a big history of graffiti a long time ago anyway? Or has it got bigger now? Hang on, I said dirt. Prostitutes and drugs, and you changed the conversation to. I'm trying to just keep Norway you on point. A, <laughs> Norway has a long history of. Um, so does Norway have a long history of prostitution oh, you want to bring and drugs? It, yes, it does. Like, does it? But you. But, is that a Viking thing? Funnily enough, not a very long history of stencil art. Is that you that's done that then? Me? No, no, no. It who was, was the, so? Who was the thanks? Of course. What made that so special for me was Martin Reed is like a really, really uh, big name within the academic world of modern street art, whether he'll admit this or not. But it's always really special to hear someone talk about this scene in a way that is completely different to everything else that you would expect. And I'm never gonna be coming at you guys with this like crazy academic critical thinking. I'm, I'm just not that way wired. So what I want to try and do is offer the platform for people that can talk like that and then bridge it into just anyone that takes a moderate interest in street art and try and, and, and find these different ways of looking at things and, and, and maybe just shape opinions and ideas in a different way. That for me was one of the highlights of my year without question. It was such a beautiful setting. The second reason I played that is that was just filmed with my little top mic and my camera. So it wasn't the most uh, sophisticated of microphones. So I want to know how this sounds when I play it back. The third clip I have prepared for you came right back at the start of the year when it was dark at six o'clock outside and everyone was wrapped up and it was cold and it was, you know, that feeling where like winter has just been going on far too long. The, the, like as we're approaching winter now, this is kind of like a little taste into that feeling. Anyway, I had invited the uh, Nottingham based uh, organizer, curator, director, uh, Sazizo Firi to come down and have a chat with me about really representation in the arts. And this is another avenue I think is a super important area of discussion is um, how do we get closer to a point where the magazines and the blogs and the vlogs that we're looking through isn't solely straight white male muralists um, and I think if you go on any website now you will find there is an overwhelming dominance of white male faces and not to say that white male faces can't give us something amazing as we have seen they 
continue to do so. So I think it's up to the people that are involved in creating projects, whether they're curators, whether they work on blogs or magazines or podcasts or whatever it may be, whenever they are the cultural tastemakers and gatekeepers, I think they all have a really important role to play in making sure that the general public is getting access to as much of a wide range of different influences as possible. And I don't think as a society we've currently hit that target that we should be hitting. And I really wanted to bring in Sazizo to talk about this as a stepping stone into opening up this dialogue further. This is something I will uh, be really kind of conscious of. There are always limitations in, in, in kind of the expectation and the reality. I will always do my best to try and offer as wide a range of, of ideas and influences and cultures as I possibly can. And it's something I've previously in the past kind of thought, am I doing enough here? Am I doing enough to give people a platform where there isn't already a platform? And if I'm not, what is stopping me from doing that? And this is why I brought in Sazizo as a way to just hear it from her side of, side of things. I don't want it to get to a point where it's like every time I have a person of color come on the show, it has to be about race. Like that is like so far from what it, I where I want to be. And I'm always in danger of doing that. It's like, oh, you've got a black person on. You know what they'll love to talk about? Being black. And it's like, hang on, I've missed something. I've gone too far into the other world if I venture down that. But as a stepping stone, I think it was important to at least address this and start to see the avenues of discussion that we can go down. And I promise you, um, I will be doing my best to open up this discussion with as many people from as many different backgrounds as I possibly can. Um, I will at no, like, I have no doubt that at some point I'm going to get this wrong. I might have already got it wrong in the course of this episode, um, but I promise you it comes from a good place, a place of uh, recognizing my privilege, recognizing my position in the world and doing my best to offer a platform to people that may benefit from having a platform. Um, so this was taken from our interview, my interview with Sazizo back at the start of the year. It's great seeing like black faces and, and, and representation, people who look like me on the streets especially. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult to say whether it is tokenism, whether they're doing it because it's a trend or if they just realise that actually there needs to be more representation. And if that's the case, then fair play to them, you know. I think before last year, I didn't really see much um, on the streets in terms of kind of like black representation. Um, and the only times I would see maybe black faces or black figures on the streets or within the urban environment was if it was, I don't know, like a mural, someone who'd been killed or, you know. And I even remember someone making a comment about, I think it was a piece of dress work um, of, um, from his You're Enough series um, and someone asking questions about one of the women he had painted. It was like, oh, did she die or did she? So it's, it's almost like, do you, you know, it's almost like when a black person hears is painted like maybe within the urban environment or it's almost like is, is it like a I don't know a tribute to someone who's died or why couldn't it just be a normal person what would you like to see more of coming from the you know the mural circuit the the contemporary circuit what would you like to see um, sort of put in place or actions being taken by those organizing and those invited um, I think in I mean I suppose it depends where you are I mean you know, England or well, the UK is a very multicultural like country, and it would just be great to see um, more representation on the streets um, in terms of, particularly with like figurative pieces as well. It's a difficult one. I mean, for me personally, I would like to see more representation, more people that look like me. You know, it's not so that's not to say that okay, we we have to have like less kind of like representation of white people or whatever because you know white people are still the majority in this country but it would just be nice to have more representation of black people and you know south asian people and southeast of all races as well um you know different people that represent society as well you know people who have what society considers as flaws you know you know why not have more people you know representation of people who may not fit this um I don't know, this ideal of beauty 
what it is and just have normal people that people can look up to on the streets. I'll put links to all these videos in the description and I'll also make sure I give them all a shout out for their Instagrams and everything like that. Their social media links that you can follow if you want to go and check them out, see what they're doing. Uh, Sazizo is becoming a real cultural uh, tastemaker in the city of Nottingham, which I'm only hearing more and more good things about. And I uh, whilst I am based out of London, this is in no way a London-centric uh, podcast. Um, it will reference London culture, London um, experience, but I, you know, I don't want it to be as 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 confined as that. So I want it to be as open as possible. But hey, I want loads of things for this. Let's move on to the fourth clip. So the second last clip that I have for you today came uh, about a month ago at the time of recording this podcast and it was a Skype interview with um, a street artist from Yemen called Murad Subay and he was actually put onto my radar through Instagram. Um, uh, 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 someone that follows me called Laura Butlin um, sent me a message just saying, she slid in my DM, said, hey, Doug, love the podcast. Uh, she didn't say that because it wasn't a podcast back then, but she said, hey, Doug, love the channel. She probably didn't even say that. She said, hey, Doug, um, I'm doing a dissertation on this street artist from Yemen. It would be really cool if you did a video on him. And I thought, well, look, ask and you shall receive. So I did my best. I started researching Murad. I took a took a shot and I, um, I, I sent him a tweet. I said that like such an old man. I sent him a tweet. I did. I gave him a little tweet uh, and he got back to me uh, really quickly and was like, yeah, I'm up for this. So we set up a time and we did a Skype interview and the whole thing lasted for about an hour and it was to this day one of the most memorable interviews I've ever had. I really found it amazing to hear someone talk with such a genuine love of art and for it to be used um, in such a manner where it you know, he's doing this from the heart of Sana in Yemen, a city which is affected by mass famine, constant bombardment, aerial attacks. And he's standing talking about these experiences of going up and doing stencils and paste ups in the street with this kind of like a big open puppy dog um, full of life. And I just found it so heartwarming to see someone faced uh, to have be living in a place with such um, injustice, such oppression, such um, such conflict, um, but to still approach what he's doing with the, the, the passion and the open-mindedness that he was doing it with. And I, I, I could happily just play out the whole interview on this podcast, um, but I'm just going to give you a little clip just now. If you guys like the way that this sounds, and this is the one I'm actually most conscious about because it was purely done through Skype. If you like the way that this sounds and you're like, look, I haven't had time to sit and watch it on YouTube or whatever, I'll put this out just as a sole audio file. Um, just let me know in the comments of whatever platform this whole thing goes out on. Um, so here's a little clip, a little excerpt from my interview with the Yemeni street artist Murad Subay. One thing I find particularly uh, interesting is is the fact that you're you know m most artists when they go out and do something illegally on the street they pick a name they hide they are completely hidden and they they they, they have an alias and with you you've you very much gone under from the start your 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 birth name and you you know you're obviously very okay with being here doing this with me um, you must yeah. have been in you, this is a conscious decision and you must have been into some kind of trouble with this how does this play with regards to you know your identity and your well-being your safety <laughs> Well, I, I will tell you something. Sometimes the safety is, is in your uh, appearance also. It's not only an in hidden. Uh, you have to face sometimes. Uh, but, you know, I will tell you something. This is what what the revolution told us, uh, taught us. Um, it's not to stay in the shadow. You have to get into the first row. Uh, I mean, to, to the front. And um, yeah, I think um, because the revolution a little bit, it was only two years, which is 
the greatest of freedom we tested. It's from 2012 until before the invasion of the capital uh, in 2014. You should know that it was the golden uh, time for for the youth, for the people of Yemen. They were like feeling, um, I mean, a little bit like uh, they didn't know what what's the freedom really. It's, it's the taste. This is what led me until now. It's even the words of the people when you stay. Uh, painting the streets and and also about the uh, hiding my name or something like that. It's Yemenis people. The, the different uh, of art, street art in Yemen is different from other world because we, uh, the artist not only the, the artist uh, he called the people children, young, old, who are artists or not. They participate equals. They are all the artists. And also, uh, it is hard to to call people to participate with you, and you are hiding your name. Uh, it is it is hard in Yemen uh, yeah. to yeah. have been, yeah because people need someone to to see, need someone to trust. They should go with, and they go. And uh, it's about trust, I think, because I'm working in terms of campaigns, and people should know who am I because. Uh, and then they will uh, go on. That's it. So you can find Murad on Instagram at Murad Subay, M U R A D S U B A Y. And as we approach the final section of this podcast, my last clip, I've saved something unreleased for you. This is a teaser of something that I aim to release. <sighs> as soon as I possibly can and this is going to be possibly confrontational to some degree but I'm just going to do this anyway so uh, back at the start of summer 2018 uh, the artist Ben Ayn was uh, found guilty or pled guilty to assaulting his girlfriend in the middle of uh, an art show uh, in the Serpentine Gallery and there was a deathly silence around this matter in the art scene. And I got actually so frustrated by this, I, I made a video and it sounded like this. This entire scene was built by rock stars, vandals and anarchists. But there's a difference between damaging property and damaging your girlfriend. I don't care that Ayn has seven kids. I don't care that Ayn's been booted out the US for some reason or another. I don't care if Ayn is caught snorting coke off a hooker's tits in a toilet cubicle in Shoreditch House. That's his business. But he should not be given a pass at exhibiting one of the most abhorrent examples of character I can think of. I reached out to Ben to see if he wanted to do an interview and I didn't hear anything back and I was about to put this video out and I'd actually uploaded it to YouTube. And just before I hit publish, I get an email from him saying, yeah, okay, let's do an interview. And kind of like, you know, it's one of those moments where your heart stops, you're, you're sweating and you're like, shit, this is, this is really going to happen. And he ended up canceling on me twice and everything got pushed back. And eventually we found ourselves sitting in his studio, cameras set. I was about to interview one of the biggest graffiti artists in the world, an artist that was the first British artist in history to ever have his work hung in the White House, a man with followers all over the world, about to interview him as to why he assaulted his girlfriend. And I promised him I wouldn't put that video out until he gave it the green light. Um, out of respect, um, I didn't say I wouldn't put anything out. I will tackle this subject because I actually got a couple of people messaging me saying, look, what are you going to, have you heard about the Zine thing? Are you going to say anything about it? And I felt conflicted because I have this, um, this the whole thing about what I'm doing is I'm trying to um, address the stuff that isn't being addressed elsewhere. So we sat down and it kind of sounded like this. So, uh, Ben, thank you for taking the time um, for letting me into your studio to sit down and do this. Um, 
I guess I'm just going to get straight into into the, the sort of the, the elephant in the room so that the sooner that's out in the open, then the, the easier it is for the rest of the conversation um, to kind of take place. Um, I, I guess maybe can you elaborate or tell your side of the story of what happened? Because so far there's only bits of information that exist online. And most importantly, what, um, what, what took you to the point of, of, um, of uh, <laughs> look, I'm not going to sugarcoat assaulting your girlfriend. Uh, so. But as I said, I promised Ben I wasn't going to put that out. Um, without his signing off. I haven't edited the full thing yet. Um, I just, I, I haven't had time to put the full thing together. So he hasn't had a chance to green light it or not. I'm just telling you this because it exists. This interview exists and whether or not it goes out in that format um, is one thing. If it doesn't go out in that format, I will address that at a later date. And it is a topic that very much needs to be addressed in some way or another, not to vindicate anyone, but to discuss um, why the art world is silent, how this affects artists, how this affects victims, the notion of celebrity status within the art world in a world where everyone is, you know, campaigning and saying me too, hashtag me too, um, you know, Brett Kavanaugh is the devil, Donald Trump is the devil. Well, if this is existing in the world of politics how are, and, and Hollywood, you know, who are we to say these things when we can't, um, you know, make sure that we're doing everything we can not to be on our moral compass and high horse and to, to you know, make sure everybody is perfect at all times, but to at least open up the dialogue um, to address issues that really should be addressed. So that was a little teaser, a little kind of like, uh, okay, there might be something coming up in the future. Um, one way or another, it will be addressed. Um, like I say, I just at this exact point don't know how it's going to look. But you've made it this far into my very first edition. I'm sorry this was very much like a sort of nostalgic clip show. But hopefully it's given you a flavor for what might be coming in the future. Um, please make sure you hit subscribe, whether you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're listening to it on, on the podcast format, and let me know what you think. This is the time to do that. I really, this is the kind of like, you know, the baby stages where the next couple of months are gonna be the most important. Do you think this sounds okay? Do you think I'm too breathy? Do you think I need to be closer to the mic? Do you think the content doesn't quite work? Do you think the Skype interviews could work? All that stuff I will take on board and it will start to shape the future of how this podcast goes. I really do hope you've enjoyed listening to this. Um, I thank you so much for making it this far. Um, for the very first time, my name's Doug. This was Off The Wall. Thank you for listening.